Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Jack Ma plays his trump card. The Alibaba founder delivers on a promise made to the president to create one million jobs in the USA, starting with small businesses in Detroit. Plus, the inside track on the Trump administration's plans for tech. Insight from the founder of Code of America, who was in the room alongside tech's biggest heavyweights for the first meeting of the American Technology Council. And Uber's tipping point, why the embattled startup felt it was time to finally let passengers reward drivers for service. First to our lead. Alibaba is pulling out all the stops for U.S. business entrepreneurs. The Chinese e-commerce giant is kicking off a two-day event in Detroit, Michigan right now, drawing in thousands of U.S. business owners and aiming to learn how to succeed in China through Alibaba. For the company's founder and executive chairman, Jack Ma, it is following through on a promise he made to President Trump to create one million jobs in the U.S. earlier this year. He's also trying to lure 10 million small businesses to trade on his e-commerce site. Joining us now from New York, Brian Buckwald, co-founder and CEO of Bomoda, a consumer intelligence firm that works with clients in China to provide research on Chinese consumers, and Brian Nider, a partner at Lead Edge Capital, which includes Alibaba in its portfolio. Brian Nider, I'm going to start with you. What do you make of the fact that Alibaba is holding a conference in Detroit, of all places? I, I think it's great what they're doing. I think that they're really trying to get out to American businesses, both small business owners, uh, farmers and agriculturalists, as well as uh, larger brands. And they're trying to educate them, number one, on what the opportunities are in China, which are massive. And number two, get them sort of signed up on the Alibaba platform to say, look, you've been selling in North America for a really long time or in Western Europe for a really long time, but there's so much opportunity over here in China and the economy is growing so much. You should bring some business over here and you should start exporting here. And there's a lot of Chinese consumers over the last 10 years with the rise of the middle class that, that, that are looking for really interesting uh, products that are produced here in America. And it's a, it's a great potential marriage. Brian Buckwald, is the demand actually there? That, that, that's a good question. I, I'd almost separate the, the demand from the supply. I do think that there is a demand in China for American goods. We've seen that repeatedly. The question is where will that supply come from? I, I do think this, this conference is, is great marketing. It's, it's strong politically when you think about Beijing as well as Washington, D.C. and playing to both constituencies. As a matter of practicality, I don't know how many of these small businesses <coughs> will be successfully selling on Alibaba within the next two to three years. However, there is certainly a demand by Chinese consumers for foreign goods. Brian Neider, what do you make of that as an Alibaba investor? Look, I think that they have to position themselves for the long term, no doubt, right? So maybe within the next six or 12 months, uh, they don't have as many uh, US-based sellers selling on their platform. But this is a long-term play. And when we think about modeling out the business and, and where we get excited is, what could they do over the next three, five, 10 years? And so if you look at some of the projections that they made, and, and, and many of them were, were pretty ambitious from their analyst day two weeks ago in China, they were talking about doing a um, you know, trillion dollars in gross merchandise value through their platform by the year 2020. That's three years from now. And I think that certainly some help that they could get from American suppliers would, would help them reach that goal. So I become very excited, and I'd agree with, with, with my counterpart here that, that most certainly it might take a little bit of time, but over the long term, I think that, that this is certainly an opportunity for the company to capitalize upon. Your counterpart, the other Brian, Brian Buckwald, <laughs> Jack Ma promised he would create a million jobs in the U.S. Can he deliver on that promise? Uh, if we're looking at a 100-year time frame, I, I think he could, Emily. I, I, I don't think so over the next three to five years. I think the, the math doesn't, doesn't really work in his favor. Um, that being said, uh, there's a lot of trade that can obviously happen on, on Taobao and on Tmall. And what, what Jack is really doing here is he's trying to open up the U.S. market to Alibaba more, uh, more prodigiously than it has been. He's trying to get the brand in front of more small businesses. But more importantly, he's trying to make it more acceptable in the eyes of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other groups who have been, to a certain extent, um, battling out with Alibaba and, and some of the issues they've had regarding, for instance, counterfeits.
Now, Amazon made big news by agreeing to buy Whole Foods. Alibaba has interestingly been investing in grocery uh, for several years now. Uh, Brian Neider, do you see Alibaba and Amazon now clashing on a new battle line? Uh, to some extent, maybe, but they're doing this in, in very different geography. They're doing this in very different geographies. So, you know, when you look at what Alibaba is doing, it's primarily in China, obviously. I don't think Amazon has any uh, um, plans to get in there, though who knows. Um, and, and, and Amazon's takeover of Whole Foods certainly will, will make for a lot of interesting uh, dynamics, but I don't necessarily think that, that, that they're competitive head to head. I think that probably they're learning from one another's strategies, and you see that across the board. They've gotten into uh, uh, payments, each of them, they've gotten into media, each of them, they've gotten into um, uh, uh, cloud. And so, you know, certainly they're learning from each other, but they don't directly compete in the same geography, so it's a little bit hard to say. Brian Buckwald, there have long been concerns about Alibaba and Amazon clashing more broadly. Will that ever come to fruition or no because of the geographic limitations? Well, well certainly uh, Amazon has had ambitions in, in, in entering China more aggressively and, and they've looked for different paths in as Alibaba has looked to move out of China. Um, Alibaba has found probably greater success looking at um, rest of Asia and, and other non-call it US centric markets. Um, that being said, if you, if you look at what, what Alibaba is doing, it's taking more of the Walmart approach. They're looking at more, more mass brands. Their investments in companies like Sanyang, their partnership with um, Shanghai Balian Group have been much more about discount uh, marketers, uh, large-scale supermarkets, not really the Whole Foods of the world. Also, Alibaba, at the heart of it, is a marketplace, whereas Amazon is really the retailer taking principal risk. You can almost see Amazon succeeding on Alibaba with Whole Foods selling into China more so than the two of them really competing in China, I think, at least in the near term. I just don't think that Amazon is the competitor that a Tencent, for instance, is for Alibaba in China right now. Brian Neider, as an investor in Alibaba, do you, do you feel a threat from Amazon? I mean, certainly not in, in, in the core China market. There's a lot of other companies that are doing well in China. And like Brian said, uh, you know, certainly Tencent and JD.com are, are the ones that come to mind in their core retail business. But you know, to date, Amazon hasn't really played there to the extent that Alibaba wants to move into the U.S. and is trying to bring U.S.-based sellers to sell goods and services uh, uh, into China, let's say. I could see there be becoming a little bit of overlap. But to this point, no, not really, just again, because of that geographical diversification. They learn from each other more than they compete with one another. All right, Brian Neider of Lead Edge Capital, Brian Buckwald, co-founder and CEO of Bomoda. Thank you both. Jack Ma, as I mentioned, expected to speak at this conference in Detroit later this hour. We will bring you headlines from his remarks as we have them. Well, Adobe just released second quarter earnings, beating analyst estimates for sale and profit, proving again that switching to a cloud-based subscription model for its digital media and marketing software is paying off. Adobe also forecast revenue in the current quarter that was ahead of the average analyst estimate, suggesting it's fending off competition from Salesforce and Oracle. Adobe shares are gaining in late trading. If these gains hold through the trading day on Wednesday, then its current level would mark a record high for the stock. Coming up, tech's biggest titans gathered at the White House to discuss the road ahead for U.S. technology. We'll hear from Code for America's executive director, Jennifer Palka, who attended the meeting alongside Apple's Tim Cook and Microsoft's Satya Nadella. This is Bloomberg. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin says the Trump administration will not be satisfied with 2 percent economic growth. This as lawmakers continue negotiations behind closed doors on tax reform. Mnuchin spoke earlier to Bloomberg Television. I think we've been pretty consistent in saying we're working every week very closely with the House and the Senate to have a joint plan when we come out. And the idea is to get us all on the same page so when we release the combined plan, it's going to get passed. And it's going to get passed by the House and the Senate, and the President will sign it. And it's our focus to get that done this year. It's critical to the economy, and we're working every day to get that done. Mnuchin also says the administration is committed to unlocking the economic capital to create jobs, better wages, and getting growth above 3%. 
Tech leaders say the U.S. government needs to modernize after President Trump's senior advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, held a summit at the White House on Monday. Apple CEO Tim Cook was just one of the tech titans in attendance, and he commended Kushner's steps in getting the government equipped with the latest technology. The U.S. should have the most modern government in the world, and today it doesn't. Uh, and it's great to see the effort that Jared is putting in in working on things that will pay back in 5 and 10 and 20 years. For more insight on the Tech Summit, we are joined by Jennifer Palka, Code for America founder and executive director who was in the room at this meeting and attended uh, in Washington, also served as deputy chief technology officer under President Obama. Jennifer, great to have you here. Thanks so much. So how productive was it? Well, to the credit of the people who organized the meeting and the tech CEOs, there were breakout sessions um, on pretty substantive topics, um, things that people don't normally put on the news, like procurement reform and how to get the government into the cloud and digital services for citizens. And I saw that most of the tech executives actually went to the sessions that, that I was in and had a you know a pretty substantive dialogue about these these issues. So you're walking into this having worked for the Obama administration. Give us some color from the room. What did it feel like? Well, again, to the credit of, of the folks there, um, it felt like the people who've come into the White House since Obama left have looked at what uh, I and many, many other colleagues did to say, this is how we're going to modernize government, and said, yes, let's continue and accelerate that. Um, and I think that they're doing a good job of strengthening the United States Digital Service and the Technology Transformation Service, which are two units that absolutely do great tech for the American people. So uh, that's good. Um, I'm happy to see them doing that. They have a, a long way to go. On the other hand, they're doing this in the context of an administration uh, whose other actions don't necessarily represent uh, what's best for the American public if you're talking about services. Let's take a listen to what uh, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella had to say to President Trump. Take a listen. All the technology that we have today is because it started, in fact, in the government and the research institutions you funded, as, as, as well as the enlightened immigration policy. Of course, I'm a beneficiary of that, and I hope that we continue uh, to be able to sort of really make sure that the American competitiveness is what helps us set policy for it. Immigration has been a hot topic. For yes. President Trump, how did he respond to that remark? I don't recall what the president said to that remark. I also know that there was a lot more probably said behind closed doors. Mm. They had five breakout sessions per slot, and I was not in the one on, on immigration, though I was very glad to see it on the agenda. Did course. President Trump seem receptive to what was discussed? President Trump certainly responded to those tech CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, I would really look, I think, more towards what the tech CEOs are saying to each other and how they're going to hold the president accountable, not just to the things that are about modernizing technology, but modernizing in the service of what? This should be in the service of services working for the American public, and they're going to have to stand up and ask those questions as this keeps going. Right. You posted ahead of this meeting and talked a little bit about why you were going and yes. said, politics aside, you know, why did you think it was important to be there? Because, Even if maybe you didn't agree with the politics. Right, because there, there's politics and then there's governing. And governing is our problem. We have to get involved if it's going to work well. And I mean we as citizens, I mean we as Code for America, and I mean we as the tech industry. We're going to have to get more involved if we're going to make the, the business of governing work, the, the guts of it. It doesn't work well today. Try applying for food stamps, for instance. If you want to try to do it online, it's good that it's online, uh, until recently it's an almost an hour online, 50 screens, hundreds of questions, doesn't work on a mobile phone. You know, we've shown you can do that in seven minutes on a mobile phone, including uploading your documents. It's not just that that's a burden on the user, it means we get bad outcomes. Uh, food stamps, SNAP, nationally, is one of the programs most highly correlated with better health and ed education outcomes for kids. So when we have half of our population in this state not on the program, half that could be on the program, we're missing out on all of those benefits that is going to cost us a lot more later when we have to intervene. As the former deputy uh, CTO, what are the biggest challenges they're going to run into when it comes to modernizing government? 
The biggest challenge they have right now is, is getting the talent that they need. There are amazing public servants already working in government, most of whom came under the previous administration, though a shout out to those who's come since and really said, you know, as one person rep replied to me on Twitter, um, I'm going in because, yes, it feels like, you know, uh, if our government has, is sort of a house on fire, I'm going to run towards that, not away from it. Um, those are great at public servants, and some will continue to go. There's also, you know, wonderful people who've been working in government to try to do this for so long. But we really need to keep that talent going, and it's harder to do it when, uh, when people don't agree with the policies of the administration. You started an organization called Code for America. Yes. This issue came up. Tim Cook uh, even spoke about it. What is the top of your priority list? We're for the trying, president. We're trying to prove that government services can work for all people equally with dignity, that, that government can work the way that it should in the 21st century. So we're there to reframe this conversation from modernizing to making it work for people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do that, um, not just by speaking up at meetings, but by following up and showing that it can work, and then asking everybody who works in tech to pay attention get involved, support government when it's doing the right thing, and hold it accountable when it's not. All right, Jennifer Polka, Code for America founder and executive director, thanks so much uh, for stopping by and sharing the inside scoop with us. Thank you. Coming up, Apple's ongoing legal battle with Qualcomm heats up. We'll bring you the latest claims filed by Apple next. This is Bloomberg. Amazon wants to dress Prime members. The company is testing Prime Wardrobe, a service that allows customers to test clothes for a seven-day period. Amazon is using this twist on the subscription box phenomenon as part of a broader effort to compete with companies like Stitch Fix and Trunk Club. The online retailer is developing its own staple of fashion labels to sell items like suits, dresses, lingerie. According to analysts polled by Bloomberg, Amazon could overtake Macy's as the U.S.'s largest clothing seller this year. The legal dispute between Apple and Qualcomm is ramping up, and it is Apple that's firing the latest shot. In a new filing, the iPhone maker claims there is, quote, mounting evidence that Qualcomm is operating an illegal business model designed to extract high patent royalties on every wireless device sold. To be clear, Apple is adding these allegations to a complaint already filed in January, which accuses Qualcomm of trying to monopolize the chip market for wireless devices. Qualcomm disputed the earlier claims in an April filing, saying it's Apple that's been dealing unfairly. Joining me now to discuss Bloomberg Intelligence's litigation analyst, Matt Larson, now with us here in San Francisco. So new allegations. How does what Apple's saying change the case? Uh, so Apple is basically building up the rhetoric in this case. They are... Um, trying to set the stage for a much larger dispute, a much more expensive dispute potentially for Qualcomm. Um, Apple has long alleged that Qualcomm is double dipping by both selling chips and charging royalty rates on the same technology on other people's chips. And so essentially what this case does, uh, or this amended pleading, is it builds out Apple's lawsuit and tries to sneak some more things in. Uh, again, this is setting the stage for a much longer slog, potentially years in the making. These are two companies that used to have a fairly symbiotic relationship. What's at stake for Qualcomm? So for Qualcomm, this is huge. It's a large portion of their licensing revenue. Um, licensing makes up roughly one third of Qualcomm's business model and the royalties here are potentially about a half billion per quarter. So this is very significant for Qualcomm. It also potentially impacts license agreements that Qualcomm has with other companies. These are patents that are licensed on industry standard rates and so whatever deal one company gets trickles down and impacts what other companies are able to negotiate down the road. And how about Apple? What's at stake for them? So for Apple this is all about device margins. Um, Apple is looking to reduce the royalty rates and, uh, and licensing fees that it pays to third parties. The less money goes out the door, the more profit Apple gets to keep on its iPhones, iPads, and other devices. So this is really a margin story and uh, protecting the amount of that average selling price that Apple is able to keep for itself. What are next steps here? Next steps in the litigation, uh, like I said, these are the initial phases. So Qualcomm will respond in July. Um, Qualcomm also has another lawsuit pending against the contract manufacturers that make the iPhone. Uh, Qualcomm is seeking to recover royalty rates from those companies and a hearing on that is scheduled for August. Apple is working on 
its own chips now as a result of some of these disagreements. How does that change the overall landscape? It puts a little bit more pressure on Qualcomm. I think that this uh, this overall dispute will evolve into some kind of deal, hopefully, that involves potentially a joint cooperation agreement, some kind of licensing components, and some kind of balancing of business interests. Like you said, they've worked together very well for a long period of time, and a likely resolution is going to be more than just a simple licensing agreement, but we'll have a couple of different components and probably balance out Apple's aspirations. And for Qualcomm, rather than putting all its eggs in one basket, I mean, how are they diversifying their portfolio for the future. So for Qualcomm, you know, this this sets the stage for next generation licensing agreements. Qualcomm is participating in a lot of different standard setting organizations. They continue to develop a, uh, a portfolio of chips. They're looking at other opportunities to license their patents outside of mobile. They're looking at uh, you know, potential opportunities that 5G and the Internet of Things presents. So for Qualcomm, this is about securing good rates and a key part of their business while also opening up doors for other business opportunities. All right, Matt Larson of Bloomberg Intelligence. Great to have you on. And here in San Francisco. Yeah. Coming up, we will take a look at software company Tableau and find out how it is faring after shifting to a subscription model. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump welcomed Ukrainian President Poroshenko to the Oval Office today. The talks between the first, this is the first between those two leaders. It took place before Trump meets with Russian President Vladimir Putin next month. Ukraine, Ukraine re relied on former President Obama for support when Russia annexed Crimea. The U.N. says Israel has taken no steps to comply with a Security Council call to stop all settlement activities and, in fact, has substantially increased building in the past two months. The U.N. considers settlement construction illegal under international law. Emergency services in Portugal say they are making progress containing a massive wildfire. It has killed at least 64 people. That's according to the AP, which says that news was temporarily overshadowed by reports of another blaze nearby. Venezuela says Chief Prosecutor Luisa Ortega Diaz will face charges for serious errors in her role as the nation's top law enforcement official. Opponents of President Maduro say Ortega Diaz is being targeted for breaking with the government over its plan to gut the National Assembly and rewrite the Constitution. Russia says it is waiting for a detailed explanation from the U.S. on why it shot down a Syrian warplane. The U.S. says it downed the craft after it went on a bombing mission. Russia warned it would track U.S. aircraft as potential targets and suspended a hotline that's intended to avoid mid-air collisions. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Tuesday here in Washington, 7.30 Wednesday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Elisa. Well, the big news in the Asia-Pacific today is the MSCI uh, confirming that China A shares will be included on the Emerging Markets Index. So this is a case of fourth time lucky uh, for those China A shares. It was a line ball call, this. No one was quite sure how it was going to go. So uh, watch for a reaction in Shanghai today. And also just 222 stocks admitted to that index, making up 0.73% uh, weighting overall. Other things to watch today, ASX futures are off. Uh, quite considerably, about 0.3 of a percent on that weaker oil price. Uh, Nikkei futures mixed. Watch out for Toshiba today. We could have an announcement on the winning bid for the chip unit. If not today, definitely sometime this week. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. Uber is out with a new, some say long overdue, feature, tipping. It is something CEO Travis Kalanick has long been opposed to. Now that Kalanick is on an indefinite leave of absence, Uber is making big concessions to turn its image around and keep drivers in the seat. Here with more on the story, Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for Bloomberg. So, what happened? Yeah, they finally sort of broke down. I think this has been coming for a while now. They really have wanted to pivot to sort of rebuilding their relationship with drivers, but they knew, you know, if they announced it while they were still dealing with all their internal employee problems, uh, they weren't going to get much credit for it. So first they sort of dealt with their white collar workers, you know, the 14,000 uh, sort of full-time employees scattered around the world, and now it's this 180-day campaign to help drivers, and obviously you need to start off with tipping because that's that's the main one. Interestingly, Lyft came out saying they've already collected $250 million in tips, which is a lot yeah. when, when you add it all up for right. their drivers. Right. Does this really, is it, it, how compelling is this, you know, in terms of a feature to woo them to one company or another? Well, I think, you know, drivers at the end of the day are optimizing for how much money they make, mostly. And often Uber has given them more, you know, trips, and so that's meant more money. That's why many drivers stay with Uber, but one of the key things that they will say is Lyft cares about me and the reason is because of tips. So the question is how much do you know those drivers who move over to Lyft now say, oh, you know, Uber cares about me about the same. And I think this campaign, you know, sort of with a continued rollout of features for drivers and incentives is going to be an attempt to sort of pull those Lyft drivers back towards Uber. What do we know about driver turnover rates? Yeah, I mean, there was a report that after a year, you know, about 25% of the drivers are still there. So it's a at, lot at Uber of churn. In particular. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there's a lot of churn. I mean, this is always part time work. So Uber That's would. That's incredible that yeah. the Uber machine can even keep going when only 25% of drivers are sticking around every year. Right. At some point, you imagine they're going to sort of hit the ceiling of low income sort of workers who would be sort of tempted to work for Uber. Um, that haven't tried it and decided it's not for them. Now, are there any issues around these changes being implemented while Travis Kalanick is not there? When he returns, will he embrace them? Well, he must have been in the loop. This has been a sort of a long going debate. You know, there was an internal email sent out that this has been, you know, I think, uh, you know, two top execs have been working on this and sort of strategizing across the company. So I can't imagine he was solely out of the loop. I'd already reported that he was coming around to the idea. We don't know where he stands on it, but. I don't think this is something where it's like, Travis is gone, let's do something in direct defiance of him. You know, it's more, okay, clearly, you know, even he notice, knows we need to change. Here's a moment to sort of turn the page. What have you been hearing about how things are running within the company with him not there? Yeah, well, we have this sort of mystical 14 person committee. We haven't seen a lot about, you know, about how that's working. I wrote a story about, you know, the three top operations executives, Rachel Holt, Andrew McDonald, um, Pierre, long name that I'm not going to remember. <laughs> and, you know, they're like running, they've divided up the world and they're running the day to day. But I think in terms of the big strategy questions, you know, we're going to have to see it. It's not clear how those things are going to get answered. You know, how much money you spend on Uber Eats or self driving cars? Like, who makes those decisions? It's probably still Travis Kalanick right now. All right. Eric Newcomer. It's been a few days without you on the show. <laughs> Great to know there's some Uber news. Exactly. Uh, back in the spotlight, Eric Newcomer, who covers Uber for us. Thank you. Well, another company changing the way it charges its users is Tableau Software. The data visualization business moved to a subscription model earlier this year, and Caroline Hyde caught up with the CEO to investigate how the move was going as he traveled through Europe. Caroline, what did he have to say? Yeah, Emily, great to see you. And Tableau has been going through some major shifts, as you outlined, moving to a subscription model rather than charging a single license plus a service fee. And it's all aimed at providing additional flexibility for customers who well, they want to reduce upfront expenses. Earlier, I caught up with Tableau CEO, that's Adam Selipsky. He was right here in London, and I asked him about the shifts at the company, new customers, and, well, primarily, what brought him across the pond? Well, we've had a, a worldwide customer base uh, for years now. Uh, in fact, uh, over half of our customer expansion last year was outside of the U.S., so we have a, a, a wonderful customer base uh, throughout Europe, and uh, it's really important to get out and see your customers. So here I am and very excited to, to be in Europe this week. Talk to us about customers 
last thing I read, 54,000 accounts. I'm sure that's being added to. You've got the likes of Expedia, Miller's Core. Interesting ones like HelloFresh as well, a German uni based startup, which is expanding globally as well. Yeah, we're actually really excited to be working with HelloFresh and a, a lot of other uh, startups and small businesses uh, throughout Europe. Uh, as you said, HelloFresh is a Berlin based uh, startup uh, providing home delivery uh, of food and they're really revolutionizing that industry through use of data. They have thousands of consumers sending them recipe feedback every week and they do very sophisticated analysis on recipe trends and then uh, not only uh, optimize the recipes based on that but they also work that all the way through into their supply chain uh, knowing what ingredients they need to have where in their supply chain based on the recipe demand. So it's a fascinating use case. Of course, Tableau software, it's business intelligence, it's analytics. We're talking basically about making it easier for the human to spot trends within data. Data visualization is at your core. How is it changing the world in which we do business? Well, the amount of data in the world is absolutely exploding. Uh, I think there's been a, a pretty well documented trend of how much data has been created in the past few years, but that's going to be dwarfed by how much data is going to be created in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And as all of that data gets created, uh, many organizations face the specter of being uh, drowned in it. And if you can't understand what's important in your data amongst all the sea of data, you really can't act on what's important. Many other organizations are already finding ways to really capitalize and create new business models uh, using that data. So really at the heart of it, we're trying to help uh, organizations around the world see and understand data and ultimately make better decisions and get to market faster uh, using data. And the way in which you charge for this visualization has been changing in your business as well. You've gone to a subscription model. How has that been adopted by your customers? It's gone incredibly well and in fact it's proceeded uh, more quickly than I might have imagined uh, when we embarked on it. Uh, so really at the beginning of this year uh, we really started talking privately to many customers about pivoting from a one-time perpetual uh, software licensing model to an ongoing uh, subscription model. And uh, in the first quarter of 2017, 26% uh, of our license bookings were subscription. And that's before it was even public on our website, which didn't happen until April. So uh, we really expect this trend to continue uh, accelerating, and it's driven by customer demand. Uh, subscriptions for most customers are better because it requires them to spend less money up front. Mm -hmm. It allows them to use uh, operating expense instead of capital expense. And ultimately, it's a risk reduction program because it means at the end of a subscription period, they're free to uh, make a different decision or to leave their vendor if they don't like the way that uh, the software and the service is performing. That, of course, perhaps builds in a little bit more business risk for you. How do you ensure that they do want to continue their subscription with you and don't float off elsewhere? It, it absolutely creates risk. I think it, it, it forces you to be a, a better supplier. And uh, we like that. We like the fact that it will cause us to, to sh sharpen our, and improve our game. And I, I think that uh, if you're willing to bet on yourself, which we are, uh, then if everybody is, is moving to a subscription model, which is very common in the software world, uh, the, the, uh, the companies that are the most innovative and that service their customers the best are, are likely to win most of those, uh, uh, most of those uh, uh, competitive bids. And so we like those odds. You said that it was about a quarter of your customers when, even before you started marketing it online towards subscription, that was in the Q1. Where do you stand now and where do you aim to see subscription as, as a percentage? Well, I think if you look at all of 2017, uh, we'll definitely uh, finish the year in the mid to high 30% in terms of uh, subscription bookings. And long term, I think the vast majority of our business will be subscription. Uh, again, it's, it's better for customers, and most of our customers want to move in that direction. And so we're just trying to uh, move along quickly with them. That was Tableau CEO Adam Silipski. Emily, next he jets to Germany, and I do the same to you. All right. Caroline Hyde in London with the CEO of Tableau. Thank you for that. A stock we are watching now, shares of Comcast fell the most in two years. In Tuesday's session, Moffitt Nathanson analyst Craig Moffitt downgraded the stock to neutral, citing rising cord cutting and slowing broadband growth. Comcast actually gained pay TV customers in the last quarter, signing up 32,000 people in the period. But Moffitt wrote in his note that the market is now too complacent about cord cutting. Coming up, Airbnb is tackling the global refugee crisis with a new platform. Can the startup also become a philanthropic powerhouse?
Another feature I just want to bring to your attention, our new interactive TV function. You can find it at Bloomberg, on the Bloomberg at TV Go. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message. You can ask me a question. You can play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Just check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Airbnb is outlining ambitious plans to use its platform to help refugees and evacuees around the globe on its new Open Homes platform. The goal, to find housing for 100,000 displaced people in the next five years. Earlier, we spoke with Susan Wynn Bailey, an Airbnb host from Denver, who's hosted several refugee families over the last few months. She explained why she decided to sign up for this program. When I first was contacted by Airbnb asking if we could host a refugee in need, um, it was just an unequivocal yes. Uh, it's consistent with our values um, as a family, and quite honestly, it aligns with, I think, the broader vision and mission of Airbnb, which is to serve those in need. And we spoke with Airbnb co-founder Joe Gebbia, who made new announcements about this platform from Paris and how the company is trying to get more people like Susan signed up for the program. Well, you can imagine over the last five years, we've seen incredible growth of our, our host community. And it really begged this question, what if we became proactive about situations in the world rather than just reactive to natural disasters? And so pretty quickly, the topic of displaced people came front and center to us. Currently, there's 65 million displaced people. Uh, that's the most since World War II. It also happens to be close to the population of the United Kingdom. So as we looked at what is Airbnb really good at, short-term hospitality, engendering trust between strangers and global presence, we thought we might extend this natural generosity into a platform that we're calling Open Homes. You call this 21st century philanthropy. Why are you doing this? I feel like we have a responsibility. We have this incredible asset, this amazing community of over 3 million homes in 191 countries. And I think it's, it's really, you know, uh, looking around in the world of, of how we might apply what we're good at with where it's needed the most, this to us makes a lot of sense. You're a $31 billion company. You've got investors who've placed huge, huge bets on your future. How do you sell them on the idea that this is worth devoting time and resources to from a business perspective? Well, you know, I think that this is really just a natural extension of, of what we're already doing. And it, it really is the question of why not provide the same solution we do to travelers as those who are displaced? How does this benefit the business of Airbnb? Does it benefit the business financially? Well, Airbnb does not take any transactions on these kinds of connections. This is all about generosity and hospitality in times of need. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, it's a part of our business. Certainly, you know, we have a great core business that is able to fund this sort of thing. Um, but to us, this is just an extension of, of the values of our company coming to life in the real world. What happens when there's a problem, for example, when a host and a guest don't get along, or maybe there's a, a cultural clash? Well, we partner very closely with third-party agencies that are well-respected. They've been doing this for many, many years. And we work very closely with them and provide the same customer service that we do when you use a regular product as well. Airbnb was hosting a massive convention for its hosts in November 2015 uh, when the Paris terror attacks happened. You were there. Uh, there is a very divisive debate going on around the world right now uh, around immigration and terrorism. There's talk of closing borders and building walls. How do you respond to that? You know, I think, if anything, right now, the world could use a little more understanding of each other. And if that's something that we can do through our platform by allowing people to open their homes to those who need it the most, then we're, we're happy to play that part. Tech leaders are making critical decisions right now about how to work with the U.S. presidential administration. Uh, we've seen some tech leaders drop off presidential councils, for example, when they've disagreed with President Trump on climate change. What is Airbnb's strategy when it comes to working or not working with the White House, even on issues you disagree on? Well, you know, we see home sharing as a nonpartisan issue. We work with Democrats and Republicans alike. And so, you know, we'll work with, with any administration, Democrat or Republican, to bring home sharing to life. 
Airbnb is expanding with this open homes platform. You're also adding more experiences uh, to the platform instead of just places to stay. Give us an update on the business and plans for an IPO. <laughs> Well, from a business standpoint, we're really excited because in 2016, we launched Trips, which allows anyone to offer an experience and really answer that question, what can I do? Now that you helped me discover a really local part of a city, how can I find out the cool and interesting things to do? And through experiences, it allows our hosts uh, on Airbnb to share their skills, talents, or passions and allow any outsider to feel like an insider when traveling. Now, Joe, Airbnb has three very involved co-founders, and as the company has grown uh, and moves forward, how do you distinguish your role and what are your top priorities? Well, I think each of us is nicely settled into what our passions are and what's most valuable to the company. Uh, I certainly enjoy thinking about the future, um, and I run a design studio inside the company called Samara, which is an R&D team, and in fact is where the origins of the Open Home platform began. Um, of thinking about how we might utilize Airbnb's core competencies to put a dent in this really global problem. Our conversation there with Airbnb co-founder Joe Gebbia. Interestingly, Gebbia told me there are no regulatory issues around this new effort because no money changes hands. You can check it out at airbnb.com backslash welcome. Coming up, the man who helped spearhead one of Tencent's most successful ventures is looking beyond our own planet for opportunities. This is Bloomberg. Chinese tech giant Tencent is pushing its relentless pace of startup investment into, of all places, outer space. Bloomberg's Stephen Engel caught up with Tencent's exploration officer, David Wallerstein, in Hong Kong. We are open to the unexpected. Um, and so how do, you, how do you evaluate an unexpected company? Right? Um, let's say a company says they're going to do something with a space technology. You've never heard about it. Is that something we want to get involved in or not? Planetary right? resources is one. As an example, sure, we have worldview. Mining view. of asteroids. Is that Satellite something? Logic. Yes. Right. I mean, you've invested in this company. Yes. With some of the space ideas, I have to admit, it is in, by design a little more out there. We've also supported a company called Moon Express that is planning to be the first private company to land on the moon. Tourism? Okay. Uh, Is it that won't be tourism. No. no, that'll first be effectively drones, you know, oh, uh, yes. unmanned okay. uh, vehicles yeah. doing, uh, you know, certain tasks yeah. on the moon and then uh, building up from there. We'd like to see how far humanity can push the frontier. And there's these open questions. What more can we do beyond Earth? What could we do with asteroids? What can we do with the moon? Um, and sometimes it's not immediately clear exactly how that will uh, become a business. I would say uh, the investments off Earth are a little bit more um, aspirational. The greatest challenges that humanity is facing now are really here on Earth. Uh, we've invested in a company called Satellogic. Um, they're actually based out of Argentina. And they can uh, see what's happening on the ground at a resolution of about one meter. And they do it with a very low cost uh, satellite model. We love this kind of technology because it's so exponential. Uh, think about it, you put a satellite in the sky and it's circling the globe at about 17,000 miles per hour. Inherently, this business is global from day one. With one satellite, it's seeing what's happening all around the world. It, it'll go around the Earth every 90 minutes and it's covering the, the entire globe and it's picking up uh, information about Earth so that can be useful to so many different kinds of industries. As you identify the companies to invest in, at what stage do you go in? Those that have beta trials or those who yeah. are already have product to market? Well, what? we we can often start as early as possible. I mean, we, we sometimes, um, we'll sometimes do investments of a couple hundred thousand dollars with a company of two people. I mean, we start right at the beginning to a very large scale investment of a public company. Um, a lot's been written re recently about our investment in Tesla, for example, which is kind of a, almost a similar type of idea, but it's just a very later stage company, obviously, and a lot more money to get involved. How does the Tesla investment fit into your remit? Obviously, it's strategic. It could be financial yeah. returns are great as sure. well, yeah. but it fits into the cleaner, greener EV future, right? Yeah. This is such a great example of a company that has fundamentally re-architected re um, what it means to have transportation as well as new energy, and then having such a smart ecosystem around bringing that all together. That was Tencent's Chief Exploration Officer, David Wallerstein. And that does it for now. This is Bloomberg. We'll see you tomorrow.